G'day everyone, my name is Cautious Pancake, and today I'm going to run through the top 10 ways to drop zombies from your horde base path, look at some of the pros and cons of each approach, and check how effective they are at dropping zombies. Without messing around, here's the elevated horde base that we're going to use for our testing. It's elevated 12 blocks off the ground to avoid as much of the rage mode as we can, and the first modification we're going to make is to add in a sledge turret. This is about as simple as it can get when it comes to zombie droppers. All you need to do is add in two concrete blocks off to the side of the elevated path, then drop in your sledge turret. Heading back around, you can jump back up and come up to the top, and then I'll detach the camera and summon in a few zombies. Using ferals, just so they don't take too long to come up to the top, and also they better mimic the run speed on a horde night. As you can see, when they're bunched up like this, the sledge turret does get in a couple of hits, but doesn't manage to knock them all down. From there, we're going to test the base during a horde night. I'm only picking a day 14 so that it's relatively straightforward. We don't have to deal with the cop spit and all those other distractions. And as you can see, the sledge turret can't keep up with the flood of zombies coming through, but it doesn't do too bad, roughly getting every second zombie or so, depending on the spacing in between. The larger the space between the zombies, the more likely the sledge turret is to get each one. So looking at the pros and cons, one of the advantages of the sledge turret is that it will give you XP for kills. It's easy to install, and you can usually get one at around the tier 3 reward level from questing. Some of the drawbacks though, are that at the beginning you're probably limited to a 10 block default range, where the sledge turret needs to be within 10 blocks of you. It's not normally available for a day 7 horde, and the sledge turret also needs repairing. However, it does give you an overall drop rate of around 54%, meaning that only half of the zombies on Horde Knight are likely to get to you. The second zombie drop technique that we're going to look at is one of the easiest ones to build. Heading up here, we just need to knock out three blocks. And the block that we're going to use then is the pole centered block. Now it's not quite as easy as you might think. If we put the three blocks in to replace the cube blocks that we knocked out like this, and then summon in some zombies, you find that they actually just run straight across the top, despite the gaps in between the blocks. What we actually need to do is place an additional block on the middle one just like that, and that will in turn result in the zombies needing to try and jump up over that one off another block that doesn't have a great surface, and in the end they pretty much all just fall down. Just like that. Again, just switching on the Horde Knight so that we can see how they perform under realistic Horde conditions. You'll see that it's pretty much the same. The zombies all run up, try and run across, and fall down. Looking at the pros and cons for the vertical poles, the biggest advantage to this technique is that it's extremely easy to build. Just needs four blocks, and you can obviously add more if you want more security. The drop rate that you will achieve from this technique is about 98%. Every now and then one zombie will make it, but it's pretty rare. The drawbacks of this approach though, are that zombies will tend to hit them a little bit more as they fall down, just because they're trying to jump at the time. And obviously for those that don't like floating blocks hovering in midair, the realism of the physics on this one is a little bit of a negative, but that may or may not bother you. Technique number three is my personal favorite, and that's the half plate blocks, which leave a gap in between them and allow you to rotate one at the bottom and one at the top to give yourself a gap that the zombies will try and run through and typically just fall down. I typically use the pole half plate block, or more correctly, the pole plate half block, and rotate the first one like this, which we can just attach to the side that we're on. If I can jump across like that. And the second one, we need to rotate across and up to the top to maximize the gap between the two halves. If we just jump out and have a look from the side, this is how it looks. And the zombies will run along and try and jump from one low block to one high block, except without jumping because they think they're two continuous blocks, so they just run straight through. Bringing in some zombies. Run up, drop down, and hit straight through the gap. See, they almost ran on top of each other's heads there to get across. So if we get rid of them, one of the things we can do to help alleviate that problem, 
and make it all run a little bit smoother is bring the zombies down to the level of that bottom block before they try and run across. You could do this with a very plain ramp block, but it looks a little bit funny when you do that. So what I tend to use instead is the Wedge Narrow series. Starting with the Wedge Narrow High, then switching it to the switching it to the wedge narrow middle next and the wedge high to finish. That provides just a gentle slope that the zombies can run down to before they try and run across. Jumping into Horde Knight, you can see the zombies run through, run across and fall down just as expected. There's not much else to this one. It's a pretty straightforward build, which is one of the advantages. It's a little bit harder than the uh, vertical poles, but not much. It also has the advantage that it doesn't tend to get hit much, so it's a pretty sturdy option to go with. Probably the only negative that I can think of for this approach, if you do use the ramp down that I have here, if you're trying to shoot the zombies as they come through, that ramp will change their head height, making them a little bit harder to shoot. The drop rate that this one achieves is 100%. It isn't impossible that a zombie will get across, but it is very, very rare. One thing I should mention is if you're sick of the pole height plate box that I've used, there are a couple of options. You can also use the uh, triangle, quarter triangle I think it is. No, can't see it there. Hang on a minute. If we go triangle, maybe it's not in this series. Nope, there it is. The plate quarter triangle. Again, rotate the first one to the bottom and the second one up to the top like that. Achieves the same sort of thing. And there's also a semicircle block. I think it is, should be in there. And there it is. The half pillar one meter plate. If you rotate that one around, this one rotates funny, but there we go. And like that. Gives you the same sort of result. And just to prove it, let's some bikers. Works just the same when they're not being distracted. So zombie drop technique number four is one that I was just gonna call push blocks. These are blocks that the zombies are gonna run into and do nothing particularly special around, but the shape or the setup of the block is gonna push the zombies off to the side. Originally, I'd wanted to include one of Shawil's videos around the road railing block. I'll put a link to that in the description below, but apparently that block isn't available anymore in Alpha 21. So that was an Alpha 20 special only. Instead, I'll show you one that I used in one of my very early videos on an easy starter Horde Knight base, which uses a combination of the wedge narrow high blocks underneath and this gable three quarters full block on top. The wedge underneath is angled so that the zombies will tend to slide off the side and the gable three quarters is placed on top. Three high so that the zombies can't get across the top but angled like this so that they tend to go in the direction of the slope of the wedge block underneath. Bringing in some zombies. And you'll see just how it works. The zombies run up the path as usual, get to the block, try and get around it and fall straight off. Moving into Horde Knight again, just waiting for the zombies to get here. And as you can see, the zombies don't get past the block and they all tend to fall off, sometimes on the wrong side, but that's okay. And I've got a few that are just gonna hang out on those lanterns. Obviously that would be something that you could remove from your base so you didn't have the problem of them just landing on that section. But overall, this technique still works very, very well. The advantage of this approach is that it is extremely easy to build and no zombies will get past. That is until they break the blocks. As you can see, the zombies are trying to attack the blocks because they are blocking the path. That's one of the big drawbacks. And the other drawback of this approach is that the construction does block your line of sight. So if you're planning on trying to fight the zombies at the same time, you will need to offset your protected area where you stand from the zombies so that you can see where they run into the blocks and either shoot them or try and melee them or whatever. The drop rate is 100%, but that's only until the base fails. As you can see what happened eventually to this one, they attacked the block on the lantern side and brought the base down because they can't get path and don't loop as naturally as they do in some of the other options. So it's an option, probably not the best one on the list, but certainly something to keep in mind. So since we couldn't include Jawedle's video in the last one, due to the fun pins removing the block from the game, instead we'll need to look at one of the most recognizable base designs in the game, and that's the Killing Corridor. This one's a little more complicated to build. 
we're going to start with widening the path out to three blocks wide here and here. And then we're going to attach what is the crucial block in this build, which is the wedge inside corner full. Attaching these to the corners, then putting in some usual wedge tips in between and returning to place the corners on the other side. The advantage of these corner blocks is that they fool the zombies into thinking that they can run across the top of them as a full block when actually there's only a half block there. Just going to add a cube half here to give some stability and a wedge underneath it just to try and blend it into the column. On top of the side walls, we place the cube one half blocks, rotated around like this. These are the blocks that stop the zombie from running across and getting to us. We'll do them three high, just so that they can't jump on each other's heads and get across. On the other side, I'm just going to put some centered bars. Same sort of thing, three high, but I'm using them just so that we can see what's going on when the zombies get here. Okay, time to test it out. Make sure we've done it correctly. Bring in the ferals. Up they come and down they go. No hesitation. They think they're running on a full block straight off the edge and down. Switching on Horde Knight, you can see that it acts no different here. The zombies run straight through, straight up, and straight off the edge. The advantages of this type of zombie dropper is that it's a better looking option than many of the others. And on top of that, it provides a nice wide open area inside the corridor for you to add traps or an area in which to attack the zombies. Other than being a slightly harder build than some of the other options on this list, there's no real drawbacks to this design. And that's one of the reasons it's an iconic build within seven days to die. Also worth mentioning that the drop rate for the killing corridor is 100%. The next technique we're gonna try is what I've called the C drop. This is a zombie dropper that I found whilst trying to build something to try and offset the path for the zombies. My crawling zombie sniper base, where I wanted to be able to shoot down the corridor and not have the zombies that made it through get in my face and block my line of sight. Pieces that you can use for this one are a plate block, a plate half triangle and that's pretty much all you need the build's a little tricky so we're gonna have to jump back and forth from time to time to do this one you need the blocks rotated at the top we're gonna go out two blocks from here into a five block gap like so one and two then we need to again rotate the triangle up to the top and we might just jump the cap this time. It'll make it easier to place, like so. And then the next one is rotated back towards us on the side like that. If we can line it up, there we go. And one more continuing that like so. Then we've got to bring the path back towards us, but I can't see from here. I might go down on the lantern should be able to get an edge to see from there. There we are. Now we need this to return back towards the horde base, like that. And we can continue the path for another two blocks. One there, and one here. And then jumping back across, we can bring the path all the way back to us, like so. One and at this point you can also start to see where the sea drop got its name that shape is vaguely c-shaped and it's where the zombies will run down and instead of running around the path they'll tend to run straight into the middle and fall down into the gap finishing off the path there we go perfectly stable for us to walk on but if we jump across and bring in some zombies, you'll see that it doesn't quite work the same for them. Up they come, and down they all go. Perfect. Switching to Horde Knight, and as you can see, the zombies will mostly run down and fall down the hole. 
but every now and then, I suspect when there's a little more traffic, or for a zombie dog in particular, they can just run around the outside. You can see when they get a little bit of a push from behind, they also tend to skip across rather than fall down the hole. So for this one, the advantage over the build is that it gives you a clear line of sight straight down the path and that any zombies as they tend to go into the dropper will move out of your way, allowing you cleaner shots. But as a negative, it's a little bit harder to build. It's a little bit harder to remember how to build. So it can take a little bit of getting used to to get this one right. It also has a slightly strange drop rate percentage. About 83% of zombies will fall down, so 17 to 20%, if you want to round it off, will come through and get to you, so one in every five. Now, that's kind of not high enough of a drop rate to be a completely effective zombie dropper, and it's also not low enough to give you sort of constant combat if you're looking for a zombie dropper that just eases off the number of zombies to make it a more manageable horde night. So it's this weird sort of in-between drop rate to not allow you full combat, but it's not doing 100% drop. If that made sense, well done. Thanks for sticking with me. And that's the C-Drop Zombie Dropper. The next technique is another one of mine as well. This one is adapted from the Lemming Tower build that I did back in Alpha 20 and have revamped for Alpha 21 after the developers tried to nerf the railing that I used in Alpha 20. To use it on a base like this, very simple you just put in two ramp blocks to the side like so add in two cube blocks to connect them up and then add in two more ramp blocks to bring the path back to the original location like so as you can see we've just created a little kink in the walkway and the magic block that we need to add next is the plate diagonal. If we bring it over here and copy the rotation and place one there and another one here, these two blocks will give the zombies something to bump into, which they will then try and jump to clear over. And because of the orientation of the ramp blocks, they will typically just jump straight off the side. Bringing in the ferrules, here we go. There we go, one's over, two's over, three's over fours off the edge there we go so one zombie made it which is actually a little lower i'd expect more zombies typically to make it through bringing on the horde knight to see if that's correct we can see how many of the zombies make it across and how many jump over of their own volition there we go of the first five just one nope two jumped across and depending on how you want to count it, this one might be a little bit different in that I've kind of got two zombie droppers here, just because it's easier to do the path off to the side and then bring it back. For those of you that have seen the Lemming Tower video, you'd know that I actually use quite a few of them as the path winds up all the way around the tower. And that turns it from being a moderate drop rate to being almost fully AFK. So the advantage of this approach is just that it's a little bit different and it involves forcing the zombies to jump rather than just dropping them through a hole. The other advantage, depending on your approach, is that it doesn't drop too many zombies and it actually lets through quite a number, which could be of benefit if you want to do more combat during the Horde Knight and want to use the zombie dropper just to reduce the full impact of the Horde Knight, but still have something to fight. You can add more and more of these along your path, just make it a little bit longer. And as you increase the number of zombie droppers using this approach, you will get obviously fewer zombies to fight. So you can tailor it to your preferences. The negatives of this approach is that it's a little bit less reliable and it's also on the fun pips hit list. They've already nerfed it once from the railing that I used in Alpha 20. And I wouldn't be surprised if they nerf the plate diagonal block again in future, just to try and cut this one out. In terms of drop percentage, the drop rate for this one is 48%. So for two of the zombie droppers on a path like this, you've cut out 50% of the zombies or thereabouts. So you can simply add more if you want to cut out more of the zombies. The next technique that we're going to look at is what I've called a zombie push. And this one is where we don't really do anything to make the zombies fall other than give them a narrow path to walk on and something to block up their progress so that they bump into each other and knock each other off the path. This is one of the most iconic designs that you'll see in many, many bases in Seven Days to Die. And for this one, I'm just gonna use one of these really, really thin poles like this, side centered so that it's considered a path, and say six blocks long, like so. That 
then anywhere in the middle of the path, we just might add in a railing block, a railing so that we can see through it and shoot through it, but it can be really anything you like, just something to force the zombies to stop and jump over. Bring in the test zombies, as you can see, it looks a little bit weird, but it's very, very effective. If the zombies come up, the first will try and jump over, the second one runs into the first one and falls down, as to some of the others. For this one, there's really not that much to it. It's an extremely common and very useful technique to stop the zombies from getting to you, especially when you join it up to the base using the same thin post. So effectively, there's one zombie dropper where I've got the railing and a second one at the base itself. This means that there's usually only ever one, maybe two zombies that can get to you at a time. So it really limits the amount that can get to you. And as long as you've got a good loop for them to run back and come around, then you've got an endless supply of easily killable zombies on Horde Knight. It's an easy build and there's really not much of a negative to it. For those that are interested, the drop rate of this at the railing itself is about 58% and obviously more zombies are going to get dropped as they come up against the ones at the horde base. That's pretty much all there is to it though. Super easy, super simple, but really quite effective. So for this option, I've already added in a generator bank and a little bit of a switch, which gives away that we're probably going to be playing with some powered door options. It really wouldn't be a good zombie dropper list without some. We're going to knock out all of the path in here and start to build across instead. I'm doing this one whilst flying around in God mode just because it's a little easier to show what's going on. We're going to go across two and then down four blocks like so because we're going to use a 5x3 steel garage door. There's plenty of other power door options you can use. This is just the one that I felt like using today. We need to do the other side as well so that it's got something to sit between. And most powered doors also need to rest on something solid from a stability point of view. But because I don't want the zombies to fall down and land on a concrete block, I'm going to use my hidden stability blocks trick and put these frames in instead. This will allow the garage door to go in and sit on them, but any zombies that fall down don't have a block to land on and will just fall down to the bottom as usual. So that's how it looks when we're finished. We then just need to wire up the switch to the door, turn it on, and there we go. With the door open, it looks like we've got a path, and with the door shut, the zombies should fall down, and we're good to go. Bringing in the zombies with the door shut, you can see though that they don't run up the path as you would normally expect, and that's because although the path looks like it's level with the blocks next to it, there's actually a small gap. To fix it, all we have to do is add in some plate blocks on top like this, and then repeating the test, we can get the zombies this time to run straight up and run straight on to the garage door. Jumping back in, if we turn the switch off, you'll see the zombies immediately fall down and we can bring them back up again by turning back on the switch and creating the path again. Switching over to Horde Knight, you can see that it works much the same. The zombies run up the path, run onto the powered garage door and just generally sit there, although they do tend to attack the door as well as our horde base. And whenever we get sick of them, we can just turn off the switch, they all fall down, turn it back on again, the zombies keep coming. Which gives you a nice little power door dropper. We can attack them for as long as we want and repeat the process. So the advantage of this approach is that because it's powered, you can use switches, trigger plates or motion sensors to control when and how the door should open which allows you to build different options depending on how you want to fight. You can either do it manually with a switch, you can use a trigger plate to step back, or the, the zombies will step on and activate the door, or you can use motion sensors to do it on a timer. In terms of negatives though, this approach does tend to use more expensive later game items, so it's not an option that you can go with early on in the game. And also while the door is open, there's no path to you, so you need to make sure that you either don't do it open for very long, or you have an alternate path that while the door is open that the zombies can go instead. Otherwise they'll go into rage mode and start attacking your support pillars. I haven't included a drop percentage for this one because it is more up to you and your control. So you can sort of make the drop rate whatever you want. Okay, the last zombie drop technique that we're gonna look at today is from the pseudo posse, or at least they're the first people that I saw doing this. And that is creating a slide using the wedge narrow series. The 
three blocks we need are the wedge narrow tip, the wedge narrow low, and the wedge narrow middle. To build it, you need your gap to be about five blocks long in total. But I'm only going to knock out a couple so that we can place the first block underneath. Get the rotation around. I'm going to slide them off to the left and place that there. We then place the next one on top and the tip on top of that, just like that. And we continue this in a sort of a five block gap in between the path or instead of the path. There we go. And I might even just place one extra block on the end like this. That way, if they do get a little bit ragey, they should attack that block instead of any of the critical blocks on the slope itself. I'll put a link to the video from the pseudo posse in the description below because they probably do a far better job of explaining this in far more detail from memory. But as you can see, the zombies will typically run up, try and run across this block, fail and fall off. Testing this on Horde Knight, you'll see it works much the same, works for dogs, works for all zombie types, great. They'll just run across, try and run all the way through and slide straight off. The advantage of this build is obviously it's extremely simple to do, it's extremely effective, and also it leaves a nice clear line of sight down the path to the zombies, meaning that you can shoot them as they come through. Once they hit the slide, they're probably gonna drop down a little bit too much to make shooting them easy, but while they're running on the path behind it, that's completely fair game. There's not really any negatives that I can think of for this build approach, and the drop rate is 100%. So there you go, that's my top 10 zombie drop techniques. Let me know in the comments below though, if you have any other favorites that I've missed, and if there's a video that I can link to to show it in action. I've watched as many as I could, but more than likely there's something else out there that I've not seen. If you found this video useful, please give it a like, and if you're interested in more videos like this one, please subscribe. As always, thanks for watching, and happy building.